So, judges, just a bit of information for you guys. When the startup's pitching, I'm just going to ask you to mute your mic and turn off your video. Uh, I'll set the timer for them. Once their time is up and they're finished with their pitch, you can come back onto screen with your questions and feedback. And that will run for five minutes. A quick question. Should we err more on the side of giving constructive feedback, like on how the pitch itself went or on the business itself? Or um, do you want us to focus more time on asking questions and, and getting to know the business a little bit more? I think more on the business side is uh, more, more important. But, you know, uh, you, you do how you feel. I think constructive feedback is also very important. OK, cool. Sounds good. Chris, I'm going to ask you to share your screen from when your screen is shared. You can, I will start your timer. The judges will come off and I'll let you know when your four minutes is up. They'll come back on and they can fire away with questions and feedback. So I'm a mathematician and computer scientist by training. Uh, and I went into, into neuroscience about a decade ago with a deep respect for biology. I had a really simple hypothesis. It's that understanding how brains process signals like images and audio has the potential to revolutionize. Of course, such a radical goal took some time. In fact, fast forward eight years. Uh, but the result of that basic research was that I believe I uncovered a fundamental computation under, underlying how your retina works, as well as uh, essentially all sensory processing and organisms. It was clear that this discovery was going to be huge. So I went to pitch our first angel, Neo, a tech fund founded by Ali Pertovi to build a team. Fast forwarding, we got a seed round of capital led by South Park Commons, Fuel Capital, and, and some exceptional individuals such as Amir Kosho Shahi and Scott Forstall. Uh, and we used this, uh, this capital to develop technologies that are applicable to today's problems. In particular, 80% of the internet is video, and that number is growing every day. So we thought about what it means for a computer to understand video like a human would. We focused on developing core comprehension and augmentation of live video and using that uh, comprehension to seamlessly change content in real time. It was through the, this development work that we identified a first major industry to deploy these technologies and, and that's turns out sports advertising. So let's talk about the current state of affairs and why there's a huge market opportunity, uh, in particular 40 billion we think, to apply our technology to this industry. In today's sports sponsorship world, brand placement is a fairly static and one size fits all approach. Due to this, ads are placed for the entire game or season, which creates a premium price that limits the market to large and generic brands that are applicable to a wide audience and who could afford the placement. Such sponsorships are less effective over time. After a while, viewers stop noticing them, so the per, per minute value is reduced for every minute the ad is on the screen. Bulk pricing, generic relevance, and diminishing returns from viewer fatigue leads to underrealized revenues in sports sponsorship. <clears throat> Alcom's real-time video augmentation solution interprets video and performs real-time augmentation to seamlessly interweave realistic graphics for localization, virtual ads, ad replacement, data visualization, and in the future, on-device targeting. Our solution allows content creators to divide the space temporally and for serving different ads in one country versus another. This technology has the opportunity to drive CPMs higher through programmatic video, let's say on the final play of a game. Let me show you what this looks like. Unlike most competing solutions that require expensive and complex hardware, such as screens, sensors, or additional cameras, Alcom simply requires a video stream to apply our neural network-based comprehension augmentation techniques. As you can see, the Alcom logos are not actually on the court, yet the ads look real. And the ad space can be temporarily segmented throughout the game. In this example, we replace the Alcom logo with Nike. We believe that pauses in the action are a huge opportunity for brand integration that's not obtrusive to the game. As you can see, the animation stops and the ball is back in the player's hands. This also creates a new type of inventory that has never existed before. Localization. So we've received direct information from the leagues that they can take advantage of these new monetization opportunities for in-stadium sponsorship. The NBA, for example, sees this as a way to make every game a home game through creating regional feeds. Here we have two local businesses sponsoring the same space on the court where viewers only see the ad that's relevant to them. Personalized experience. So our plan is to provide viewers increasingly personalized experiences such that each viewer can eventually see something uniquely their own. Here you see different ads being served to individual devices based on their preferences. Data visualizations. Additionally, we can do things that aren't strictly sponsorship, such as overlaying data onto the field of play. Rather than putting an opaque informational box in the way of the action, 
we're creating a seamless integration that enhances it to the viewer's taste. This can be customizable, such as toggling statistics at will, or providing social or betting overlays reflective of the in-game action in real time. Regarding our GTM strategy, what's important to note is that our plan is to engage with the right partners who can adapt our adopt our technology as we progress on our journey. In the first phase, it's the leagues and their agents. In the second, it's broadcasters and distributors who touch Chris, the viewer. And in the third, yeah. You can keep going, but it will just eat into your time from the uh, Sure, I'm almost done, I'm almost done. That's okay, but yeah. And in the third phase, we'll offer a platform that allows for a direct relationship with the ad buyers. It is with that level of integration and programmatic ad buying that a sponsor of any size can participate in sports advise. It is Alcon's mission to create an open marketplace for sports advertising where any side business can engage with their customers with un unprecedented efficiency and boost revenues for all stakeholders in the value chain. Thank you very much. <laughs> there we go. Judges, you can go ahead and come back on camera and start with questions. Can you talk a little bit about the traction to date and where you are with the early sort of technology providers? Like, are you plugging into ad networks and how to sort of give us a, maybe some examples of use cases for the existing customers? Sure. Yeah. So we're in, we're in the first phase. So what that means is uh, we're working with clubs, leagues, and and some broadcasters where whereby they provide the the band, sorry, the brand, and the sponsorship via the brand and we are a technology provider for them. So the example you should be thinking of is uh, the NBA, for instance. So uh, the, the, the teams themselves in the NBA example, they don't have the rights to their, to, their, to their video, to their feed. And so NBA, we go through the NBA and say, hey, you want to make you know, a China feed? Well, you know, we'll do that for you in real time. You just give us the, the, you know, the brands that you want to put there and we'll take care of it. And we'll, 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 you, know, you cut us a check of the action. That's kind of how it works right now. Okay. And how do you... Does it make any sense? No, sorry if that was you, too quick. So <laughs> in that example, are you selling the solution to the NBA and then you're charging them X per month and they can go do whatever they want? Or how, what's the revenue model? Uh, yeah, so it's very interesting. So the, the we expect it to be a uh, at first a per hour cost uh, for them. Uh, but then we anticipate uh, very soon to start taking a percentage of the new ad revenue. This is what the N NHL was was suggesting uh, with our relationship. And um, that's also why where we'd like to take the NBA relationship. Question, uh, just a follow-up question there. Who is going to be the one that sells those slots? Is that – I take it it's not you. It's it's the NBA is going to sell it through the agencies that are buying ads from them for their um, – That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. So with the NBA, yeah, so with the NBA, they, they'll do it with, with soccer. Football is really exciting because Manchester United, who we're, 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 we're starting a, a relationship with, they own all they own all their rights. So they can do whatever they want and they can make whatever that money they want. Um, and so it's a totally different, every sport we're finding, like I can tell, I can, I can, for every sport I can list you like the whole in, in, ins and outs. It's really kind of interesting. Every sport has a different kind of relationship with, to rights and, and content. And so... Uh, we just have to kind of attack it, uh, every sport, one sport at a time. Who is the person within the the org that you're selling into? Um, sorry, I think there's a bit of a lag, but hopefully you can hear me. Yeah, there's yeah. A, uh, can you hear me? Is it okay, guys? Maybe I should cut up my. Can you guys hear me? I, I can hear you, but your video is like really laggy. Um, so so I was hoping yeah. that. I wasn't talking over you, but better. it doesn't seem like it. Um, yeah, I, I was curious who, who you sell to within the customer org and then how long that process usually takes. Good question. Let me answer the, first, the second one first. Like it, take, it, took, it took us a long time for each of the, the, uh, the, you know, the, the leagues that we've been dealing with. So we're talking about years potentially of, of interaction in order to get to the stage where finally, last week, we're finally at the stage where NBA has given us amazing footage and says, do, you know, show us what you can do and we'll start a POC. But it took us, I mean, literally years. I mean, it's kind of shocking, but they're very, very much uh, tight knit, you know, sticky organizations. And so the first question was, how would it look with a, with a engagement or, or can, you, can you repeat the first? Oh, oh, no, the first question was um, who within the NBA, for example, are you speaking to initially? Uh, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, so we have to talk to the big so Bruce uh, uh, Sadler and then mm -hmm. Steve Helmuth, 
those are those are the executives. You have to talk to the top executives at each of these organizations. There's really no no way to get traction. And so we the way we we did it through with NBA was there's a a co co-founder of Shot Tracker named his name is Davion Ross. He's he they do AI statistics for 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 sports, particularly basketball. He's very tight with the NBA, and so he's an advisor to the company. And his his suggestion was we first uh, work with uh, say like a, a, a an NCAA test, which we, we, we which we've done now with uh, via a, a broadcast technology provider who had who has access to those rights. So we do a test with NCAA, and if that's going well, then we move into into NBA because NBA is just not going to work with a company that's that's at our level without some mm -hmm. validation. So. Um, yeah, I don't know. I hope that answered something. Some no, no, that, that's helpful. Thank you. On that note, that's just as we've. So uh, thank you very much, Chris, and thank you, judges, for the questions. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. Uh, sorry, thank my you. video was laggy. And you guys can always catch up after the event. Uh, next, we're going to have Jason from Bevs. All right. Hi, Hi everyone. I'm Jason Vigo, and I'm the COO at Bevs. And hi, my name is Victor Greer, and I am the CEO of Bevs. Uh, and Bevs is a technology platform for convenience liquor stores that allows them to be able to compete and stay relative in the e-commerce world. Uh, I myself have been a retailer uh, for the last 34 years, owned and operated several liquor store outlets, um, and understands that uh, most of the problems that a lot of these retailers face, a lot of them are just not tech savvy, don't understand technology, on how to help their business grow and how to get new customers. Other apps don't solve their needs or problems. Bev's built a system that works and that they can understand. So our entry to market was delivery because it was the most critical need for our retailers at the time. Our delivery is focused on giving each retailer the quickest, easiest way to deliver absolutely anything from their store to their day-to-day -day consumer. Next, we built alcohol brand discounting, where we work with some of the biggest alcohol brands in the world to give discounts to our retailers' consumers. In 2021, we have a few really awesome offerings, but I'll focus on two. We're gonna finish our first order processing project by the end of the month, where we are going to process orders and payments directly from a liquor brand's website to a local retailer, keeping everything compliant and then helping with product placement and delivery as needed. And next, we're working on an integration with the POS system to bring the POS system, inventory management, data analytics, and delivery all into one cohesive system for the local convenience store. The market opportunity is massive. Convenience store specifically is a $31 billion market and growing with almost 40,000 stores across the nation, which allows us to scale really fast as we're going national. Next is online alcohol. It's a $5.6 billion market and it grew 115% in 2020, which just shows we came at this perfect time to capitalize on this massive opportunity. We've seen a lot of traction. We learned a lot and grew a lot in 2020. We launched in January of 2020 and now have 160 active retailers in Southern California with hundreds of retailers in the queue. We've seen increases across the board in users, transactions, uh, paid partnerships and overall revenue and really built a formula for acquiring retailers and users at a much cheaper cost than what we make off of them. Here's an example of how we make money. With deliveries, we charge 12% plus 199 per transaction. With partnership programs, right now we're charging 5,000 a month per partnership per month. And we're only in Southern California, haven't even gone down to San Diego, which just shows as we scale national, these partnerships will be extremely lucrative. And then order processing, where we take a smaller percentage free fee but we take, uh, but we take, we see more volume in general. Here are our partnerships. So we have small and big partnerships. How these work is we first and foremost help these products get placed in stores, and then we support uh, advertising and marketing promotion. And so actually all these brands came to us, we didn't go to them, and it's because they're craving a better way to connect with the retailer and connect with the consumer. And it's really just the beginning. You know, there's all these different brands we can work with in the convenience store from chips, snacks, ice creams, medicines, et cetera. Here's our five-year financial projections, which the overall point here is as we add stores, 
we can add more users and we can really amp up these different deliver these different revenue streams including delivery partnerships order processing and retailer services here's our team you know awesome team you just met vic a little bit i've spent my career in technology and people operations and we really cover all the bases which we can talk about later in q a if you'd like and with that we're raising a 1 million dollar seed round with 17 months of runway to reach these milestones and we're offering a 75 percent discount rate and 7 million valuation gap thank you thank you Good question how do you oh sorry go ahead yeah you can go ahead i'll start the time now oh okay um yeah i was wondering how do you compare to something like a drizzly and on the kind of groceries, uh, I guess the food and um, how, do, how do you think about kind of the broader landscape of like an, an Instacart or like maybe like even some of the broader delivery platforms as well? Yeah, great question. So where we really differentiate is those are all focused on 100% delivery, right? And so we consider delivery as one component of where we compare, but we're a convenience store technology platform. So we're helping with that order processing, for example, connecting direct to consumer brands to their stores. We're helping with product placement, which is a big differentiator. These companies help deliver whatever they have, but they're not working with the alcohol brands or the snack brands to help the products get placed first. And so that's really where we differentiate. We're we're infiltrating the independent local liquor store, which will include delivery. And maybe one day we'll be partnering across these different brands. But for now, it's, uh, you know, we offer that delivery service among the others. What was your current AR? Was it 25 million? Did I see that right? Is that a projection? Oh, sorry. That pro projected as part of the example. Yeah, right now we're doing 25K monthly revenue. Got it. Okay. And what are you going to, um, Sorry. Is that, that's gross revenue, I assume, or is that net to you? Yes. Gross. Okay. Gross. What would you do with the money that you raised? Yeah. So uh, I could pull up the slide, but I'll, I'll give you a brief example. So first and foremost, it's starting to scale, right? We built out the formula for California. So we're going to get to all of California by mid year, regardless, but with the money, it's starting to scale national number two, the POS integration. So we have the company we need to integrate with, but it's going to cost some money to build out the technology to integrate within the POS system. And third is really features that are super easy to build within the consumer and retailer app stuff like referral programs, things like that. So uh, the money is going to help us scale national, build out some necessary technology and really dive into those other areas of the kind of the business that we're integrating with. I had a question. It was somewhat fast. So I'm not sure if I saw this right, but it looked like your cost of acquisition was going way <laughs> down, but also the lifetime value from the existing customers to the pipeline, like by a factor of 10x, did I read that right? Did something change in the business that you're expecting less lifetime value from the, or did I, did I miss that? No, that, that's accurate. It cut out a little bit, but I think I can answer your question, yeah. So right now there's the, the, the dual, right? Because we're a marketplace. So to acquire the retailers, a little more expensive because it takes some people to do it. Um, but like we said, lifetime value is higher because every retailer doing business pretty quickly, we're seeing that. And, and where we're best is we're retailers. Victor's been in the industry, so we don't struggle too much to acquire the retailer where I think your question more was toward the user. It is about 5X right now that we're making in full transparency. It's, it's still the gross revenue too, right? So there are a lot of costs that go into operating the, the delivery operations and setting up the stores. So gross revenue is that 5X and, and we still think we have work to do on the lowering the customer acquisition costs, which comes with funding, right? We need to be more strategic about the way we target digital ads and promotions uh, to make us more effective. But yeah, that was, if I answered your question correctly, because it cut out, sorry. <laughs> you mentioned POS integration is what you're doing next and you're in California. Are, how many different POS systems are you gonna have to integrate into or is there some consistency across the customer base? 
Yeah, I'll start and Vic if you want to add in. There are a lot of POS systems, but they're definitely some market leaders. So in California and across the nation, the SAM4 POS is the market leader, and we are already in conversation with them. Where we're starting with is a company based out of Chicago that will allow us to go national. They're really intelligent about the way they give us access to data, which is very important to us. We want to know what's happening in the store and elsewhere. So that company has 300 POS systems that will get us you know triple our stores right now to answer your question is it'll depend but there are a handful like five or less that'll allow us to cover the areas we need uh, over time we may want to integrate with a lot more i mean we're doing dual it'll be the pos integration and in uh with our current system that we have with the ipads uh, a lot of retailers uh won't go with the new pos uh they're still old school till a newer generation comes in uh, that we still have all the different options, whether it's a POS system or our current iPad that we provide uh, in all, all markets. Okay, Looks like no more questions and I think we're at our time limit unless anyone has any other questions. Good, thanks guys. I'm just there. Thank you. Jason, Perfect. Thank you, judges. Thank and, you. Uh, yeah, be sure to connect after and happy to have you, Jason. Yeah. Thank up you. Next, up next will be Jam Borrow. Hi, um, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is George Evan George. I'm the co founder and CEO of Jambo Limited. Uh, Jambo is a fintech company which actually resides out of the UK. However, we solve problems in the developing world and primarily in Africa. According to the World Bank, 400 million of the African population are unbanked, and we decided to solve that problem. So we're doing it by our fintech solution, which provides white label solutions, software as a service, to provide access to financial services for the informal, unbanked, and non-banked sectors across Africa for financial and economic inclusion. The, pro the problem we actually identified was that there's a massive unbanked population. However, when we looked at the financial institutions and the banks, the savings groups, the co-ops, and et, et cetera, and what they were doing, they weren't actually addressing this problem. And one of the major problems behind this was because of the lack of KYC information that was available in the grassroots, and uh, the lack of um, financial literacy, and the identification or the digital records that is needed to actually carry this kind of um, project out. So what we've done is we've actually partnered with not only the savings groups, but also the financial institutions. So by providing KYC information and creating a credit footprint for this demographic, we're actually able to approach the financial institutions who have no visibility of this demographic whatsoever and provide them with the information that they're actually going to need to process and onboard the, the population in this grassroots popular uh, amongst this grassroots population. So what we're looking at here, we're looking at a demographic that's hardly used any kind of financial services whatsoever because of the lack of KYC information and the data. However, what we've done in Africa is uh, we've actually adopted technology very well. So one of the um, two of the things that have actually promoted this have been internet penetration on one hand. And on the other hand, we have mobile penetration. So our solution can actually allow them or enable them to access financial um, services by a USSD platform on a mobile, on a um, major, on a normal feature phone, not necessarily a smartphone. And through this, you know, we've created cost reductions. We've created all sorts of business intelligent reporting around it and the kind of functionality and efficiency that's needed to drive financial services across this demographic at that space. So what we've done, we've created a system with AI and blockchain technology, which allows smart contracts to be used, uh, allows us to do predictive analysis, credit scoring, we build our own technology, we own the IP 100% in-house, and um, basically we've been able to do this because of the kind of team we put together. So myself and my co-founder of Moses have worked in the financial service industries for a couple of decades. Myself, I've done 20 odd years um, in the number of banks, uh, Goldman Sachs, Barclays, Citibank, and uh, the London Stock Exchange. 
Moses, uh, my co-founder, 25 year veteran in IT, worked for the New York Stock Exchange, HP, and uh, numerous other um, companies. Victory is our CIO. He's uh, had another couple of decades in the IT industry. Velma, head of relations, um, investor relations, and is based out of Kenya. And uh, Mishak is actually our head of software development, and he's based out of Nigeria at the moment and runs a team from there. So we're a very diverse team. And Africa being a great place to start this kind of project. Uh, 54 countries, we're looking at a population of 400 million. You can keep going, but it will just... Okay, I'll just, I'll just close off with that. So a population of 400 million, uh, we've done seven countries so far, four micro-savings groups, and uh, we're massive uh, through strategic partnerships, over a million users to date. Uh, we bootstrapped to date, and I'm currently looking for 1.5 million to help us scale in that respect. I'll take questions now, thank you. You mentioned you're in seven countries so far. What what is what is entailed to open up in a new country or launch a new country? The quickest way, the quickest way into the market to scale all the barriers to entry is through strategic partnerships. So that's what we've done. We've spoken to we've spoken to co-op groups in those countries, regulatory bodies, uh, microfinance institutions, NGOs and financial service providers in each one of those countries. So that's allowed us to scale very quickly via the partnerships due to our technology and our outreach. And is that a revenue share or what's in it for them? <laughs> so basically we have three well, modes of making money. Uh, the first one is software as a service. I would provide software or white label solutions to these co-op banks or savings groups across Africa who have uh, very little automation whatsoever. They have spreadsheets. Uh, the ones that don't have any kind of automation have hundreds of records, which we've been able to actually digitize in some of the markets and scale that way by onboarding them using our CSV file to bulk upload those records and cross check with the national identity um, um, database as well. I noticed a few competitors in your deck, and I think you mentioned them a little bit as well. When you're selling to potential partners or customers, is it mainly a greenfield market or are you coming up against uh, any of those players? Sure, we are coming up against uh, several players. So uh, let's look at the problem holistically. If we look at it holistically, we're solving financial services. So when it comes to financial inclusion, what our, some of our competitors have gone out and done is creating loans. And most of those loans actually become quite predatory in some way because they're high interest rates and the high default rates, but uh, the penalties are actually quite steep. And the demographic we're dealing with do not have much financial literacy. So we provide financial literacy programs where we work with NGOs on that respect, we work with coal banks, we work with market associations, farmers associations, et cetera, et cetera. So by doing that, we're actually providing an ecosystem of financial service products that they can actually access and it will actually empower them rather than just put them in debt. And what are some of the top reasons customers choose to buy as opposed to another competitor? Uh, uh, to be honest, our top our top selling sales point is actually the experience we have within our team. So, like I said, I've worked in financial services for a couple of decades um, across the US and the UK, and also across Africa. So that's where I actually got my first bite of the cherry coming to the continent and just identifying the problems and how we're going to solve those problems. I also worked with Thomson Reuters in the Middle East, so I covered Sub-Saharan Africa as well from there in governance fiscal compliance. So, you know, I was used to, to give advisory services to a lot of the regulatory bodies across Sub-Saharan Africa on GRC, um, um, KYC, anti-money laundering, etc. So that's, um, our, our, that's our niche at the moment. The experience we have and the fact that we're digitizing that KYC information and coming up with a repository of data that's going to be accessible by all financial service providers. 
Makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Judges, you have 45 seconds left. So if there's another question, go ahead. I have a question. I just wasn't clear. It wasn't clear to me. What is the technical requirement for the actual user customer? I mean, I know there's some limitations um, on what devices might be out there. Is, is there any particular requirement for participation technically? No, that's the beauty of it. So basically, we can service anybody that has a computer, a smartphone, or a feature phone. Even, even so for like. Um, all it is is a USSG code that you can access. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't quite hear sorry, that. Mark, you want to come again? Well, I just want to know what, what does the onboarding process look like for somebody who has a feature okay, phone? So basically, it's a, a straight menu, six buttons. Uh, basically, we have it in local languages as well. So save, borrow, lend, or withdraw money from your virtual wallet. And um, you can also use one-time passwords, uh, sorry, uh, one-time passcodes for ATM withdrawals as well, or agency banking withdrawals as well. So it's a very clean menu, uh, very easy to use, straightforward, and um, the fewer clicks, the better. And that's what we designed in local languages. Hello, Sagan, your time is actually up now. Thank you for your pitch. Thank and you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, hopefully you guys can connect after the event for any more extra questions. Uh, up next, we're looking for Mark DeSantis. From Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Hi, Mark DeSantis, CEO of Robotics. And we take pictures of plants. And then we use those pictures combined with deep learning that was developed over a 10 year period at Carnegie Mellon Robotics Institute to determine the health and performance of that plant. Um, we like to say every plant matters in a literal sense. The world is gonna increase population over the next 30 years by four, uh, 3 billion people, that's almost 40%. That means we're gonna have to grow more food in that 30 years than we have grown since the invention of agriculture 10,000 years ago. And we're gonna have to do it on less land and fewer resources. That's why we focus on maximizing the performance of individual plants, one plant at a time. And the way to do that is to monitor that plant from seed to harvest. Let me give you an example. Um, AA Vineyards is one of our customers in New York State. They have uh, about, 100 and, uh, about 150 varieties of table and wine grapes, and they also grow uh, baby vines. A typical uh, vineyard inspector, the person in charge of monitoring the condition of those vines and grapes, can inspect about 150 vines in a day. That's that's about uh, about 10. Per, that's about um, a tenth of an acre of vines, and they're looking for all the things that a viticulturist would look for. They look at the grapes, the leaves, the stalk all the things that determine the condition of that plant. And they're looking for disease, infestation, water stress, but they're also looking at it. And I always like to say, like a doctor and like a coach, they're looking like a doctor for all the bad things. And when they see it, then they can recommend a remedy immediately to, to save that vine. In the same sense, they're also looking like a coach. So at any given time during the year, they're looking at the condition of those grapes, the color, the size, the density, and then they can recommend treatments that can enhance the performance of that vine, grape, or leaf, such as adding water, fertilizer, or whatever might be needed at that time to improve the performance. But in both cases, they have to look closely at the plant and all the fruit on the plant to determine its condition. Regrettably, as I said, they can only look at a small portion of it. Well, we changed that. So we developed technology that comes in the form of AI in the cloud serviced by a camera. This is one of our cameras. It sits on anything that moves. This happens to be a vineyard in Prosser, Washington, and that's an ATV. 
It's about the size of a small toaster. You put it on the vehicle, really any kind of vehicle at all. We've used we've used uh, ATVs, tractors, carts, you name it. Just get the camera to move in front of the vines, and it can it can inspect about fifteen to twenty thousand vines in a day. And what it's looking for is all the same things that that viticulturist is looking for. This image on the right is an actual uh, table grape uh, vineyard in, in California. And literally, to be clear, what we're doing is we are imaging everything on that plant. This just happens to be one feature that we're looking at, which is color grading. In the case of table grapes, the, the table grapes should be a deep purple. About three quarters of that bar should be deep purple. And that's the point at which you would pick this particular cluster. And I say this particular cluster because we're looking at every grape and, and cluster and leaf, and then we're also geolocating it. So we can tell the vintner, or for that matter, uh, the apple orchard, the, the grapefruit orchard, or the tomato grow, specifically what plants in that grow need what treatments. In this case, this particular vine, row six, um, plant number seven, the results to date with this particular vintner is we were able to increase yield uh, by 5%. It's equivalent in about 70 bottles per acre. Uh, hey, Mark, this is that, yeah. Yeah. So you can, you can keep going, but um, you could, uh, I'll eat into the question time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, simple application. It's captured, collected in the cloud, then analyzed in the cloud. Insights are prevented or presented directly to the farmer. We've got 12 paying customers. We've added customers in France, uh, an Apple pilot in the UK, and blueberries in South America and the United States. We've got a team of technologists and entrepreneurs, uh, two from Carnegie Mellon and two co-founders, Tim and George. I joined a year ago as a serial entrepreneur. Jason worked at Uber ATG, where he headed products there, has the same role here, and Ben was account executive in my previous company, which was an AI-backed startup. Thank you. So I, I had a question, I'll just jump in. Um, to yeah. our, can you talk a little bit about what the camera requirements are? Is that a, is that a custom camera? Um, what is, looks like it's ruggedized and how sensitive to, um, to the movement pattern is it? Like how controlled does the ATV or the tractor or, or driver have to be in terms and, of inspection? Yeah, good question. Can drive at any speed, any, any way you can drive up to 20 miles an hour. Uh, the camera, each lens is getting five frames a second. You note the yellow circles, they have their own light source. So you get beautiful pictures. Uh, you know, it's, it's over rough terrain, requiring really no special driving skills whatsoever. We make the cameras, we take no particular pride in that fact. Uh, we're looking to outsource the manufacturer. There just are no cameras you can buy to allow this to happen. The stereo images allow us to 3D image. So we're actually creating an entire 3D digital twin of the vineyard. Are vineyards your um, beachhead market? And if so, what will be kind of the next type of um, customer you would want to expand to? Yeah, our beachhead market is grapes right now. As I said, we're in a dozen grape, in a dozen vineyards in four states and now three countries, Canada and France. We've added two and two customers in Bordeaux recently, and we're looking at a cancer a, a customer in uh, South America. Our next likely crop will be blueberries, uh, starting with a very large, a very large blueberry grower in um, in Peru, and then we've done some experiments in apples as well. We're, a phrase I never thought I'd use before: we're crop agnostic. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. How often do you have to go uh, through the inventory of vines? Is it something you do once a week or once, like, how often do you, you know, have to go through each plant? The, the, the inspection regime varies plant to uh, vintner to vintner. It also varies crop to crop. Um, some cases we thought it would be twice a month. In some cases, they're doing it every day. Uh, oh. In some cases, it's every week, depending on what time of the season. But it's actually starts now, even in the off season, we're looking at what's called bud break in France. And that continues all the way through the year. So it's a fairly continuous process. What we're does surprised your, about is they use it a lot more intensively. Yeah, I was getting, does it plug in, does your system plug into other factors, meaning like weather, humidity, sunshine, cloud cover, 
uh, yeah, I mean, all that stuff? Does it factor that in? And then does it recommend, you know, you should go look at this particular row, you know, a week from now because of the issues it was having or something? Or does it? We don't. Yeah, so we don't we, we don't incorporate that other data. It's interesting. Okay. There's a lot of sensor data available for growers of various sorts where they have micro right. weather stations, soil detectors. This is the last frontier. This is what they don't have. This is what the right. growers don't have, which is to know the actual condition of every single plant in my grow. And that is not known. So we are actually the missing link to allow all that other data to be more useful, if that makes sense. Yeah, okay. One more question, just a follow-up. How much does a, cam does a camera, camera cost for you to make? And how, how much are you gonna pass that cost on to the customers? And how many does like a typical customer use? Are we talking? Yeah, so a uh, bill of materials is about 10 grand. Uh, a typical customer will give you coverage for about 200 to 250 acres on a regular basis. And we charge much like a cell phone. The cost is amortized over the time. So there's no upfront fee uh, of any sort. And the grower will pay anywhere between two and $5,000 a month. And they can image as many plants as they want as often as they want. So you pay back as in a couple of months on the camera? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it's an easy sell. It's an easy sell. The hard part was getting over the hump, convincing the growers that we could see what a human could see. And that took about a year and we're there. I just planted my garden. Can you help me with my garden? I don't have any grapes back there. <laughs> well, you know, we've done uh, sorghum, we've done uh, apples, blueberries, um, cannabis, strawberries. There's, there's plenty of opportunities in the, in the specialty crop market. Big market. That time. Two trillion dollars. Mark, thank you very much. Thank you. Judging for the questions. Uh, fantastic. And always a chance to connect after the event again. Um, but yeah, thank you, Mark, and have a great Appreciate evening. the time. Thank you. Up next is Paul from Alpha Delphi. Okay. So go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So the name of the company is Alpha Delphi. Um, and we are a software and consulting company. Um, the system that we're making, it's called Pytho, and it's, it consists of two layers. Uh, there's an EHR layer, which is electronic health record, and there's also an AI layer uh, component to it. So what this system does, um, it's uh, a medical um, platform, so it, it it's able to uh, predict risk, uh, provide education, um, focuses on prevention as well as efficiency and Im improved communication. And primarily the system also uh, discovers candidates for medical case management and uh, triggers active medical case management uh, with either a telephonic or a field case manager that manages the case. So um, the, the cost of healthcare in the United States is among the worst in the world, uh, currently standing at three and a half trillion dollars uh, per year. Um, and a lot of this comes from, um, uh, a, a lot of this uh, cost savings can be um, done through uh, the avoidance of, of um, Get, things getting out of control. In other words, uh, sorry, I'm a little nervous if you can't tell. <laughs> uh, in other words, what our system does is improves efficiency in the delivery of healthcare um, and saves money through um, delivering that, uh, you know, improving on that efficiency. So our target customers are going to be um, government agencies as well as insurance companies and self-insured employers. And uh, not only is the United States a customer, uh, but the world at large, according to uh, World Health Organization, current healthcare spending stands at $8 trillion per year. Um, with our system, uh, it would save about $3.4 trillion of that. So as far as um, what our system does, as I mentioned some things um, earlier, but it, it predicts risks in the uh, patient population. So we're able to identify risk in the patient population. And right now we, um, we're doing machine learning, but uh, there's going to be a transition to deep learning as well. 
Um, so what's fed into the system? Um, so what's fed in is medical records as well as genetics and family history. Um, and that helps the system to recognize um, the best candidates for medical case management. Um, most of the cost in the healthcare system is due to inefficiency, which is what I was um, getting at earlier. So if you can improve the efficiency in the system, you can also drive down the cost of, ca of care. So we do that by employing nurses um, that are medical case managers. And they're familiar with the best uh, pathways to recovery, the best providers, uh, best resources. And so those are utilized as well as um, improving communication and, and that. So as far as the um, revenue model, uh, we would charge 1% of what the customer saves. So if we save the, the customer 30%, then we would charge 1% of that. Um, as far as the sales strategy, it's uh, B2B, so networking, um, advertising, uh, trade shows and the like. Um, uh, just a little bit about me. I um, about six years ago, I developed the concept. I presented it to Congress um, and drew, uh, drew up an alternative, um, I drafted an alternative uh, healthcare plan for the United States. Um, also made a documentary on the subject, which is called Diagnosing Healthcare. Uh, it's out on the major platforms. Um, and uh, here's our April, team. Time is actually um, up there. You can keep going, but it was yeah. easy. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I'll just finish up real quick. So here's our um, expenses projected over the next five years, and then our profit growth that's uh, projected over the next five years. Um, and then finally, um, the the ask, um, and the ask is uh, we're giving 25% uh, in exchange for $350,000. And that's needed for building the system as well as sales and marketing. So I'll go ahead and uh, open it up to questions. Do you have any current customers or anyone piloting this right now? Um, so we do have customers that are interested. Um, we, we are currently building the system uh, at present. So because of the fact that we're, we're building the system, um, you know, we're, we are trying to drive the interest and, Get customers lined up. Okay, so no. One uh, but we do have uh, customers. We have customers interested in seeing a demo once. How far time. away are you from uh, MVP? Um, two months. Got it. In your conversations with customers, have you talked about the business model? Um, you know, are they, is there will? Um, anybody else have any questions? Yeah, can you hear me? Can you, no, I can't hear. I, I have a question. Can, okay. <laughs> I could hear you, Mark. Yeah, I can hear you as well. Yeah, Paul, can you hear me? Oh, um, I can't seem to hear. Does somebody have a question? Can that you I, hear I us? Hear. Oh, now I can hear you. Okay. okay. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. Uh, I was just going to ask about customer uh, willingness to pay a customer. Uh, oh, you know what? I. Okay, I'm sorry, Mark. Do you, do you want to ask your question again? I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so you have to get the individuals to sign up and put their data into the system. Is that right? In order for this to be effective, so you, you sell to a business. Uh, no, no, it's uh, it's actually uh, they get medical reports. Let's say somebody goes to the ER, for example, the the doctor you know sends the medical report along with the bill to the insurance. So um, the adjusters have the reports. Uh, it's just a, a matter of uploading uh, the report to the system. And then through the AI layer, we're able to identify if uh, they're a candidate, you know, for, for medical case management. But in terms of the effectiveness of the case management, is, it, is, the, is the medical history of the person needed? Uh, not necessarily. That's just adjunct. Um, so, so no, it's, it's not needed. Got it. I, just for what it's worth, my, my experience of systems like these, the buyers usually want to pay on a covered life basis or an enrolled life basis, not on a percentage of overall cost. And, and so I, I just imagine you might have, I don't know if you've run into it, you might have friction 
in the, with, the, with the pricing model, with the kinds of customers you have. I mean, you're closer to it than me, but that would be my, my feedback. Think, think, think about that pricing model. Okay, um, so you're saying, uh, I guess I didn't really quite understand something to the effect of enrolled yeah. life. Uh, could the you companies that we've got that have anything similar to what you're doing, uh, paying either to insurance providers or self, self-insured self companies, which I think might be a key customer base for you, they, they won't generally say I'm gonna pay 1% of cost. They'll say, I've got 10,000 employees. And they'll either pay you for all 10,000, probably a lower rate, or they'll pay you for if it's something that requires enrollment or, or um, sort of engagement with the, with the individual, they'll pay per individual that's actually active on the platform. Um, so, you know, that for whatever that's worth, that, that's been our experience on the, on the pricing side of things. All right. I appreciate that. Thank you. Do you have any more questions or feedback? There's a minute left. Yeah, I, I have one more question. It looks like your expenses and the amount you're raising are are pretty different. If I'm reading it right, it's like nine million of expenses in year one, but you're eight. Did I get that right? Um, yeah, correct. Uh, as far as the expense, right. Um, but uh, that's over time. So I mean, there's revenue that's you know obviously a, a function of that. Uh, those those expenses and scaling but you're projecting is it 50 million in revenue in the first year that that would be the projection. Uh, that's based on you know a number of, uh, that's based on that percentage model versus a large customer or a set of customers got it correct yeah yeah and, and we're doing the the percentage uh, model that way because of the cost savings you know i, I don't think Many folks out there can offer that kind of cost savings, and you know it's a mere one percent of what we're saving them. So if we're saving them thirty percent, it seems a little crazy not to go for a one percent, you know, uh, charge uh, for that. In my opinion, it makes sense. F feedback on the raise: I would say show show investors what the three hundred fifty k is going to get them to, and then what happens after. Because I think right now you're still in get the product finished, built, and then and get get to your first pilot customers, I guess. That seems that that's what the round is about, more so than the five-year projection. Thank you very much, Paul. And thanks a lot for the questions and the feedback, judges. Thank you. Up next is Mark Stoltz from Olvin. Great. So my name is Mark. I'm a Chief Operating Officer at Olvin. I'm, telling, I'm going to tell you a bit more about predictive consumer AI. As you probably know, retail is lagging behind and so are brick and mortar businesses. It doesn't have access to the same tools as online businesses, which makes it often unpersonal, unconnected, unaware, and sadly enough, unloved. Was there some platform out, out, out there that can give you um, insights to um, what's happening? The data is often fragmented, difficult to use, and required integration. And it doesn't really answer the question that brick and mortar businesses need. It doesn't go about the why, the, the how, and the what. So it doesn't um, give you examples on what is affecting my store visits, why are sales going down this month, or how will I recover after the pandemic? And this is our mission at Olvin. We're trying to answer these questions and help businesses um, in different ways. We're trying to help them save costs by forecasting consumer demand so they can optimize their operations. We are trying to help them increase revenue by identifying untapped markets, but also drive loyalty by understanding consumer habits. This is why we created a platform called Almanac. Almanac is a very simple to use platform. It's a SaaS platform. It doesn't require any integration. because You can just log in, create an account, and get access to real world insights. But how does it work? We use a lot of technology. Um, when I say a lot, it's about a billion data points that we process on a daily basis, um, and we provide predictive insights. We're doing all the groundwork for you, so you don't have to do anything behind. Um, we, at the moment, we're focused on the U.S. market. We have access to most metropolitan um, areas in the U.S. Um, we also have about 10 million points of interest, so we can understand any kind of physical brick-and-mortar businesses, like a restaurant or a hotel. Um, and we have access to about 2,000 brands. But which data do we use? Um, 
We use a lot of historical data up to three years that we um, aggregate uh, to build predictive insights. Um, the main data source that we use is geospatial data. We have access to about 180 million anonymized US devices that were aggregated on a daily basis. And then we enrich it with other data sources such as event, demographic, weather, or traffic to really understand what is affecting consumer behavior in the physical world. But what can you do with Almanac? I'm going to walk you through a couple of examples. You can understand what, what affects consumers. So you can look on a map and see which areas are they shopping in based on different um, criteria, such as income, life stage. You can also get granular insights. So not only can you have insights on a national level, you can also have it on a metropolitan uh, level, but also on a more local um, area insight. We could obviously go one step further, but we want to keep the privacy of our users. Can also compare competitors, see how your store is performing versus other other chains. So we have, we have access to about 2,000 chains in the U.S. And one of the nicest insights is what we call our network analysis. You can identify your role in a network of, of points of interest and under, um, and analyze um, hidden connections. So you can understand where your consumers go before and after uh, joining your, your your point of interest. How does it work? Well, it's pretty simple. Um, we price at uh, $249 a month per seat, but right now we're giving the platform for free to help businesses recover during the pandemic. This is our team. So we all share the, we, we have a very diverse background. We all share the, the same passion. Um, we want to democratize the access of data uh, for brick and mortar businesses and help them understand what consumers are doing in the physical world. We've been fortunate to be backed by a couple of uh, VCs and uh, private investors, and we also have um, an advisory board that is, um, that is really supporting us. We've had a, quite some achievements, as many startups do. We were very particularly proud of being uh, listed AI product of the year on Product Hunt. Um, we have quite some ambitions uh, with regards to our revenue for this year. Um, we're hoping- Minutes is up, just to let you know. Uh, yes, finishing. So we're hoping to grow in the US. Uh, we, just, uh, we just joined an accelerator um, plug and play, and we're also opening our platform in the UK by the end of the year. What are we asking for? We're currently looking to raise 1.5 million. Um, this is to extend our seed investment, and most of the funds will be used uh, for sales and marketing. That's it. Thank you for listening. Thanks. Yeah, I have a couple questions. Do you, um, yes, sure. what are you paying for access to your data? Like, are you paying for data fees or where are you getting this data from? And what are the costs on so, it? We're having uh, different partnerships with different data suppliers. So, for instance, we will we'll partner with a data supplier for location data called Tomoko, or we'll, we'll um, partner with here for all our POI data. So, we have about uh, five, five to six data partners. At the moment. You, but you're paying for those feeds or how you yes, yes, okay. yes. And then second, second question for some of these uh, small and medium sized players that you're selling into, are you assisting them with how to understand this data, meaning like helping them understand what questions they should be asking and then how to interpret that data? Because in some cases, yes. they won't be experienced enough mm -hmm. to figure that out on their own. Basically, the, the objective is to make the, simple as, the, the platform as simple as possible. So it's quite intuitive. Most of our users can get access to all the data in a very simple way. But obviously, we're doing an onboarding process with a, with a, a demo. We have a support team that's, that's there to help them answer any kind of questions they have. We have a, a very good help center as well with videos and uh, articles. So it's quite, quite easy to, to use. Okay. Is there customization and logic? Could you configure your own questions? Yes. Yeah. So we we have you can create the, we, you can create your dashboard. You can save some insights that are that are working well for you. Um, we're working on on creating an API by the end of the year so that also big large corporates can plug our, uh, like pull our data, put them in a Power BI or a Tableau so that they can that's as well. Could you just quickly tell me about this incentive you have for free? Uh, for COVID, or is that yes. full sure. system for free for how long? And yeah, so it's a very good question. Well, at the moment, as as 
as I said in my, in my introduction, is we're really trying to democratize the access um, of machine learning and AI to, to brick and mortar businesses. And we thought that especially now uh, after COVID, small businesses need to have access to new tools to try to get back to business. Um, and right now we're offering between two weeks to three months of free trial, depending on the size of the business. Obviously, if you're a small retailer or like a, a small restaurant owner that needs this extra support, for free, you know, we're happy to, to be there and, and support them. And the value for us is that they start realizing that our platform is really uh, something that you can use on a day to day basis and that can really help them, you know, understand how their competitors are doing, understand, you know, um, if if their, their store opens at 10 o'clock um, and footfall, you, you see that footfall starts at eight then maybe you know you should open two hours earlier. So we really want to provide them with the, these insights that they don't have at the moment. Has anybody converted on that offer? So we have about 300 users at the moment, which is launched in December. Um, and yes, we have some potential deals that are, that are likely to close within the next couple of weeks. What's retention been like? And if there's been any sort of churn, what are some reasons customers stop using you? Right now, after a month, it's very difficult to talk about churn. Um, maybe what could be a, a way is that might be a, still a bit too complex for some customers. Um, right now, we're trying to make the search slightly easier for them to really get access to the insights and so that it can also have a dashboard. So we're working on having a dashboard. So as soon as you come in, we have an onboarding process. It's slightly more refined so that by industry, for instance, I don't know if you're in the retail industry and you only want to see, I don't know, New York and Los Angeles will have tailored insights for you. So I think this is really going to limit the churn. And we have obviously two pricing options, one that is a, a monthly pricing and one that's a yearly. So uh, it's more likely to have a churn on a monthly subscription. Got it, got it. About 20 seconds left, George, so if there's any last questions, go ahead. I guess not. The last one for you. <laughs> But um, yeah, so 10 seconds left. Um, great pitch, Mark. Thank you very much for coming. And Thank you very much. Yeah, Take feel care. free to can connect with you after. You can connect with them. But um, yeah, great pitch, and thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Up next will be Claudio from uh, Piersica. So I'm bringing him on now. OK, excellent. So uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit. Uh, Piersica is a uh, um, hard technology company. Uh, we are pre-seed. We started very recently. And um, the product that we deliver is a, a solid state battery. Uh, so let me explain what, what that is and what the problem is. Um, before lithium ion, we had lead acid and nickel metal hydride batteries. And these batteries uh, were inherently safe. They could not burn because the electrolytes were based on water and they contain water. And then in 1991, you had introduction of uh, lithium ion batteries. And for the past 30 years, the energy density has almost tripled. And now you have, um, you know, the first steps of, of introduction into EVs uh, and, and uh, these lithium ion batteries are becoming commodity. However, the move to lithium ion and increased the energy density, but it lowered the safety. Uh, the electrolytes used in lithium ion are based on uh, organic solvents, which, which are very flammable. So now as the adoption becomes more widespread, and as the especially as the size of the batteries increase from sizes they have in your cell phone to sizes they have in your cars, uh, safety is paramount. So the industry wants to move to a safe system again. Uh, so you can't go back. So in order to go forward, the solution uh, that the industry uh, is trying to bring about is called solid state electrolytes. And you have these uh, electrolytes which conduct lithium ion, just like the commodity systems. However, they do not burn and they're based on ceramics or glasses or polymers. They are not liquids. They are not flammable organic liquids. So let me explain a little bit about the company. <clears throat> I have been in this um, uh, field for about uh, 15 years. 
uh, in the solid state space battery. I worked for Toyota for about eight years, developed technology. Toyota is a, a leader in solid state battery uh, in Japan and, and the US. And then I moved to, to China uh, where I, I worked again for a very large you know, multinational OEM, the largest SUV OEM in China, which is called Great Wall Motor. Uh, I was chief engineer for a solid state program there uh, and then project director for uh, a, a, a large uh, a lithium ion battery company uh, in China, which is called S Volt. So over there, I met um, uh, a gentleman called Bob Gallion. Uh, who at the time was the chief technology officer for CATL. Uh, CATL is the largest battery company in the world. It overtook Panasonic and LG, it's a Chinese company. Um, and discussing with Bob Gallen, we, we did, decided let's go back to the US and put together this company. Uh, Bob Gallen has been in this uh, business for many more years than myself. Um, he was actually the head of the uh, EV1 project for for General Motors uh, in the early 90s. Um, so uh, myself and um, Hassan Armeli, the co-founder, um, we put together this company. Uh, Hassan is currently with Avery Dennison. Uh, he puts about half time into this company. I'm 100%. Uh, he's the global VP and general manager for their largest PNL group for Avery Dennison, a $2 billion PNL group. And we have other advisors here which I won't go into into detail at this point. So <clears throat> the technology that our company brings forth um, is 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 um, has there are two core technologies. One is related to the uh, our very lightweight solid separator, um, uh, which contains no liquid, unlike the commercial commodity, um, and, and and is based on very conductive polymers. And the other one is based on a zero volume change lithium metal anode. Uh, solid state and lithium metal anode technology go hand in hand to provide high safety and very high energy density for, for lithium ion. Uh, however, lithium metal anode has this huge problem of, of volume change. So our so solid yeah, electro- Four minutes is up. You can see into your question time. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Uh, so these are the two core technologies, the anode and the separator. Um, this is the last slide um, about the investment proposition. We have really a two horizon approach, uh, a, a short term materials approach and a long term uh, development, a cell development approach. Uh, so for the materials approach, we try to commercialize our uh, two main materials on which we have, uh, we own the IP on the separator and anode. Um, and for the prototype, we try to showcase them together into, uh, into a prototype uh, cell um, and move that forward based on our experience in this, in this field. So at this point, I'll, I'll stop and I'll take your questions. So maybe you could just go and talk a little bit about what you see are the main things you have to accomplish to get to a, a product that's ready in market and what, what market what kind of use cases would be first? And are we talking like devices or something bigger? And, and and what stands in the way for me to get from from here to something commercial? Or the key things you have to yeah. prove out? Or, yeah. Yeah. So um, it's very important to be in step with the maturity of the of the technology. Um, having worked for for uh, EV OEMs, it is very unrealistic to to pitch that you'll sell directly to EVs. Uh, lithium ion didn't sell directly to EVs. It took 30 years to get there. So our plan is to first introduce technology to, to into the space markets when they, they pay a premium for the ultra high energy density and the safety, and then to move into some uh, uh, transient markets such as wearable, um, um, and, and then move into more commodity markets for wide, uh, wide markets. This is for the cells for the uh, Horizon 2. For Horizon 1, it has to be materials, so that's a different story. They can be introduced much faster. And, and what, are there any remaining, like what are the remaining technical challenges to get to those markets? I mean, do you have proof of concept devices that can be used in those applications, or do you have to improve some aspect of performance or density? Um, 
So cur current, currently, the uh, uh, technology readiness level um, is uh, around um, materials. So we have these excellent materials for the separator and, and anode. Uh, we, we're raising money now for uh, a two-year program to, to showcase a two-on power prototype, which is about the size of the cell of the battery in your cell phone, uh, using these uh, technologies. So that is the technology readiness level for the company. Thank you. You know, your camera looks like a scene out of Blair Witch Project. I know. Isn't I? I figured you guys may be bored, so. <laughs> but good pitch. That's good. Hey, George, there's Thank two you. minutes left for questions. If you have anything else to, um, whether that's feedback or. Good. I think the feedback that I would give this is an area that I'm super interested in. It's probably not one that my firm typically would invest in. You know, we, we tend to focus on software, but I would think as you're finding investors focus, I would like very quickly get to the technical differentiation and why it's viable, especially in contrast to others. So they did a good job of talking about well, where, where quantum state escape is, but maybe put yourself in context of that. And then I would focus a lot of time on, get to you know a viable product and market that can be adopted because I think a lot of the at least my perception of this market is a lot of companies fall down between where you are and actually having something in real world applications. The sales cycles can be long, you can run into technical or sourcing challenges, etc. So I I would think um, anybody investing here would predicate a lot of their decision on, on those kinds of things. Yes. Agreed. And anyone interested can uh, contact me. We can discuss further. It's just time consuming. This type of conversation is very technical. Yeah, I, I agree. It's a tough, tough venue, but it's really interesting. I mean, interesting idea. Uh, Thank you guys. Thank you very much. Great pitch and coolest video I've seen in the evening. I know. <laughs> right. Thank you. Well, Great rest of your evening. I'm scared to smile. It looks very creepy. <laughs> no, it looks fine. Anyone that needs to contact Claudia, you can check his uh, email is in the chat on the right. Thanks, Claudia. Cheers. Up next is Stephen from Zeva Inc. So I'm with Ziva. We are uh, zero emission electric vertical aircraft established in uh, 2018, but we're roots of uh, vertical electric aircraft go back to, to 2005. <clears throat> um, there are a lot of, um, you know, th th this space is really expanding, but our differentiation is that we've taken the problem of a, a quadcopter, if you will, and turned the whole thing 90 degrees so that when we're flying forward, uh, we're generating aerodynamic lift as uh, opposed to many of the other quadcopters out there. They, they actually have a negative lift when they're flying forward. So we're, our goal is to provide personal point-to-point -point travel because that's the most efficient thing and the best for the, uh, the, the environment. Um, so we fly as the crow flies and um, I, as I mentioned, forward flight creates lift. Uh, the market is, uh, it's not sent market, you know, it doesn't really exist, but the uh, um, analysts have gotten on board and, and made outrageous claims, which I think are fall short of the actual market out there. But, uh, you know, Frost and Sullivan, for example, uh, predicts 430,000 electric air taxis by 2040. So I, I, I believe, and the reason I'm doing this is that I believe this paradigm shift to electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicles represents the largest market opportunities of our lifetimes. And, you know, it's green, it's, it's relatively inexpensive to produce. Our machine is a blended wing body and lowers aerodynamic drag. And so there's a number of features. So who we are, uh, this is my fifth startup company. I've got a great team of about 25 engineers and designers. Um, this is a picture of us at a, at a GoFly event, which is an X prize that happened down in Silicon Valley a year ago. Um, 
how does what what does our competitive advantage look like? It looks like that you know we the the competition doesn't stand a chance because we can fly 160 miles an hour with a 50 mile range for a single person EV tall. Contrast that with the max velocity of 60 miles an hour on a good day, and uh, this this is typical for a lot of the the, the standard conventional quadcopter type layouts. Um, if you follow the space, you know there's probably almost 200 different companies that are um, are going into this market at various degrees of development. The interesting thing about an investment in Ziva right now is that also if you follow the space, you see that the, uh, the, the SPAC market or special purpose acquisition company market is gobbling up these, uh, these companies as targets. And so, you know, if you, this is a chart that shows that the amount of money that was raised in the valuations uh, that have gone into just in the just in the last couple of months into Lilium and Joby and Archer. So that's kind of what we're doing financially. If you're looking for an investment that that's going to give you a very quick potential, potentially quick um, exit strategy, this is it. So our our uh, forecast doesn't include the consumer market at all. So for the next five years or so. We're looking at selling into the DOD and the uh, first responder spaces. You can imagine how much, how many lives can be saved by a medic getting to the scene with a, a small compact vehicle like this that can land anywhere, um, bypassing traffic and all kinds of obstacles. So our ask is we're raising one and a half million dollars on a convertible note with a $16 million, million dollar valuation cap and uh, we look for a near-term valuation jump uh, in the real soon because we've made uh, strides uh, in getting the technology done. Uh, feel, feel free to reach out to me and to request additional information or pro forma documents. I think I was a little fast. It's ahead of time, so judges, uh, feel free to jump right in. Can you talk a little bit about where you like that one and a half million dollar raise? Where will that get you to? Was that like having one or a bunch of prototypes, or what will that take you to? We have one prototype. Uh, we're test we're fly um, test flying it right now in the warehouse on tether. So that what the one and a half million dollars gets us is is uh, two more prototypes that um, you know as we, we can tell test with different flight regimes. And also, it gives us a runway to get major funding. So it's, we're, you know, we're going to need, uh, you know, fifty to hundred million dollars pretty quick. And uh, whether that's through a SPAC or some other means, you know, we don't know yet. But this one and a half will help you prove that out, so they can get to that next level. That's the intent in the next what eighteen months or year or what's the time frame on that? We're moving pretty fast right now. We've had some roadblocks with some supplies. You know, we we had some you know Chinese speed controllers that were catching on fire and things like that. So we're we're, we're on our third rebuild, and uh, it's looking very very good. So we anticipate having a video of the thing flying out in the wild uh, within a month or two, and that that will just basically open the floodgates. We think. You mentioned a quick uh, exit horizon. How long do you think that is, and how many rounds do you think you are between now and your exit? Um, I think that's uh, within uh, 16 months, and I think that uh, it's either zero more rounds or, or one more, maybe. And just uh, curiosity, what are the multiples in the space? Average? Uh, boy, that's a really good question. Well, I have this chart here. You can you still still see my screen? I mean, there's no revenue yet, right? So it's really hard to. So then, what what are your conditions? What are the acquisition conditions that you're driving towards for that 16 month exit? What? Act, what are what's sorry? Could you repeat the question? What are the conditions of the potential acquirer to make an acquisition of your business? What are they needing you to do or to prove or to validate before they'll make that acquisition? Oh, 
Um, we probably an LOI from a, a, a customer. I don't know if you, if you follow the space. Archer got a, a, a LOI to purchase about a, a billion dollars worth of aircraft from American Airlines, for example. So our, our key to customer would probably be the DOD because the special ops people are really thrilled with this capability. Do you plan to launch in first um, when the time comes and do you have to deal with any regulatory aspects or, or how will that work? Um, we, I mean, we're not launching in a city per se like Uber Elevate. We are a, you know, anywhere to anywhere kind of a vehicle. So we, uh, we anticipate launching somewhere probably on a test range in, uh, in a military base, but the, uh, you know, we, we will, we're in Tacoma, Washington on the West coast. Um, we're, uh, probably set up a pilot line here and then, um, we'll sell, you know, hopefully all over the world. And I think I missed the second part of your question. Oh, I was wondering if there are any sort of related regulatory oh, right. issues regulatory. that you have to deal with. Yeah. Well, we have, I mean, the, the, our, our current aircraft is registered with the FAA. Um, we have, to, we're at the stage where we need to prove safe and successful flight, and then they will sign off our vehicle as an experimental aircraft. Got it. Makes which, sense. which is, you know, that's it, it a very good point is it, it's a lot easier to do what we're trying to do than it is to put these kinds of vehicles in highly populated areas because we can fly as a, an experimental vehicle for quite a while before um, you know, we need to do anything beyond that. And hopefully that, you know, there's armies of people working on how to um, certificate electric vertical aircraft. So there's about 30 seconds left if you have any more questions or if you have any No. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Appreciate the time. Thank you very much, Stephen. That was a good pitch. And I'm sure uh, everyone there that's in the chat and the judges will be able to reach out to you. And then uh, your details are available in the handout. But yeah, once again, thank you very much for attending. Mm -hmm. Thanks for having me. Bye. Up next is Raymond from Bloomcatch. And your timer is ready now. All right. Thank you so much, Churchill, and thank you, Meet Founders, for having me here this evening. My name is Ray McGee, CEO and founder of Bloomcatch. Next slide, please. If you're like Mark, just starting his home garden, uh, then you're really looking for uh, Bloomcatch uh, because it, could you go to the next slide, please, Churchill? Uh, because you are trying to do one thing and one thing only, not commit plants aside. Uh, can you take me to the next slide, please? And that's where Bloomcatch can help you out. We start with accurate identification. We link you to local nurseries and garden centers, and we provide plant care guidance. Next slide. And how we do this, we use image recognition, machine learning. Uh, we provide the uh, user with plant care recipes, and we link you to local nurseries to purchase your plant and plant uh, supplies. And within the app itself, we have a scalable native plant database. Next slide. And there's our team. That's me on the far left, uh, looking very casual because it's uh, go it's previous slide, please. Uh, looking very casual because I took that picture not in the winter time. Uh, next to me is uh, Radu Grama, my CTO, Vera. She's my director of marketing. Dave has been with me from day one. He is my advisor as well as my general counsel. Uh, and Chris, uh, he was just brought on as a technical advisor to our advisory board uh, earlier this year, 2021. Next slide, please. Our business model, users can identify their plants and connect to nurseries for free, access to the database and ongoing plant care information, as well as access to our plant experts. It's a dollar a month with 10% going to local charities. Next slide, please. Our market analysis, the U.S. horticulture market is about 40 billion with a compound annual growth rate of about 8%. Uh, 
so we took that market and we wanted to find our beachhead and we believe it's plant parents in the U.S. That's millennials, specifically age 25 to 30. Uh, we are targeting uh, of that market because millennials is both male and female, specifically females uh, here in the DMV area. And that's our uh, obtainable market there for the next 12 to 18 months, 2 million. Next slide, please. Our competitive analysis, there's a lot of other plant apps in the marketplace right now which is why our main point of differentiation is two things. One, we wanna build a, lo a strong, loyal community, as well as, and I've mentioned it several times, our connection to local nurseries and garden centers. Next slide. Our go-to market strategy, uh, we are targeting, it's pretty simple. We're targeting gardening blogs and podcasts, especially here in the DMV area uh, to gain traction. Uh, we're, we're focusing on our partnerships. We have two local charities here in Washington, D.C. with uh, partner agreements as well as garden centers uh, here in the D.C. area as well. And for social media, uh, we found that there are kind of two dominant platforms we need to focus on, but we're not going to ignore the rest. But we're going to spend a lot more time in here on Instagram and TikTok to reach our first traction objective of 5,000 uh, daily active users by June 2021. Next slide, please. Our exit, exit strategy is really we're focusing on kind of that top prong of Home Depot, Dovey's Garden Centers, and Lowe's. Uh, we believe that Bloom Catch would be a perfect acquisition target uh, for one of those uh, particular uh, businesses because it would provide a supplemental aid for customers as well as their specific employees. Next slide, please. Our traction to date, uh, last year we raised 50,000 from friends and family. Uh, we did a successful pre-launch of the app in December, 2020. We've been doubling user downloads month over month since launch. We acquired a contract with a large nursery in Virginia and Maryland. We've been invited to apply for a Science Foundation SPR grant in 2021. And we added Chris Parnell as first member of our advisory board. Next slide. Use of funds. Uh, aggressive spring marketing push, uh, horticulture season is, is upon us, we grow our contracts with nurseries in the D.C. area, An initial pilot test with schools, beta test and launch our community section, as well as improve and expand our plant data set. We're looking to close our seed round March of 2021, that'd be about a month from now. Uh, last slide, if I'm not mistaken, and that's me, Ray McGee, that's our website, and that's how you can reach me directly. Do you know um, what the retention has been like for some of the competitors you mentioned? I think you mentioned at the beginning that you want to have um, your platform be more of kind of like a community aspect. I'm curious if you've looked into that at all and how much engagement you're expecting from users as well and how you could possibly drive that up and um, keep that steady over time as well. Yeah, uh, great question. Now, specific uh, retention rates from competitors, I don't have hard concrete numbers. What I do have is an extensive conversation I had with uh, the founder of a company called Grow It. I don't know if you ever heard of their app, uh, but they recently shut down operations. I talked to their founder to understand why after six years they were shutting down. Uh, they had high retention rates uh, specifically, and they reached a million users uh, in mid-2020. And the reason why was because they focus on the community aspect of the application. When it comes to some of the other the other competitors, I've noticed uh, a little more churn because they only focus on answering the question, hey, what is this plant, but not engaging the user in the community aspect, which is why that is where we want to focus our differentiation, engaging the community. Got it. Did that answer all of your question, or did I miss something? No, no, that was helpful. Excellent. You mentioned you're doubling users month over month. How many users do you have today? As of today, we have uh, 78. Okay. And what's the type of engagement? Is it something they're using once a day, once a week, once a month? What's the, how does, what does it look like? Well, well, the engagement was very low. Uh, there were two, there were two obstacles. And there's only one now. The first one uh, was access. So we had a couple of uh, a hiccup when we first launched. Users couldn't actually access the app. 
So after we overcame that hurdle, that was a technical problem. Now users go in there and they, they're not using it a little more consistently because they feel like uh, the technology is not completely there. Uh, however, our plant experts kind of supplement the technology. When it doesn't get your answer right the first time, which is how we built it, the plant experts come in just like you would in a garden center and they say, well, okay, the tech can't help you, but I can. And once we uh, kind of market that better, let people know we have real plant experts, which we're not heavily marketing right now, uh, then the engagement will increase. Where would you focus your uh, use of funds right now specifically? Yeah, uh, great question, Randall. Uh, specifically marketing. Uh, so we really want to uh, grow our awareness here in the DC area and we have uh, a number of cool ideas on how we're gonna do that. Uh, but primarily we wanna uh, market in the DC area and then expand to other metropolitan areas like Chicago, New York and Los Angeles uh, with our brand. So about half of the chunk of month funds would be for that. The other half would be for uh, development. Uh, like I mentioned to Matt a minute ago, we had some technical problems in the beginning. Uh, we're going to continue to have a couple of technical problems as we scale, specifically our plant images. You know, we were we got our MVP out in 2020, so some of our plant images are not of the best quality. All that stuff we want to make uh, really quality, really seamless for the user, really improve our UI UX. So that's our use of funds. Um, I'm I'm not the right person for you, but uh, contact me after I could put you in touch uh, with someone in your area that could help you. I appreciate it. Thank you. We'll do. Um, oh, okay. All right. It's a gentleman named Mike Gross. Have you considered making plant recommendations based on a consumer's geolocation and photo of the area where they want to plant? That is a uh, great question, and the answer to that is. As of right now, no, but I'm kind of going to just take your idea and put it on my developer's uh, product roadmap uh, because I think that's brilliant. Right now, we're just focusing on our beachhead uh, market. Like, I, as I said before, it's females age 25 to 30. We've created a very sort of in-depth uh, end-user profile, and that's where we're going to start and, and target before we kind of expand out of that niche. That's your time right there, Raymond. Thank you very much for you. attending. Great pitch. And um, yeah, I know, great that you'll be able to connect with Randall and hopefully that, that proves dividends for you. Thank you. Next up is Arjun from hellowiffy.com. Okay, awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, hey everyone, my name is Arjun Rai, founder hellowoofy.com, which is a smart marketing dashboard designed for people just like you and me, the underdogs of the world, aka the small businesses. For a long time, small businesses have had to use tools that look, unfortunately, like this, overly simplified, data start with no AI capabilities to really understand was it the emojis, the hashtags, the words, the images, what really did well at 30 to 50 to $100 a month in Licensing fees, it's kind of affordable, but it doesn't really help small businesses, especially during the pandemic. Now, when you take a look at solutions that are enterprise grade, you kind of expect the solutions to have the ability to answer all the questions I just asked on the previous slide. But guess what? There's a lot of data, very little science to it. It's going to cost you fifty to $500,000 a year in licensing fees, and it still doesn't really help the small business owner, let alone even the enterprises. But the enterprise, at least they have a unlimited marketing budget to be able to compete with. <clears throat> as soon as you come into Hello Woofy, what you'll realize is that it's very visual. There's a lot of white space. Everything is color driven. Purple indicates long term strategies. Blue indicates the complete opposite. Those are your short term strategies. So simply put, it's as easy as starting to type in a post and it automatically comes up with the perfect copy for you. So for, of course, how are you? And Churchill, we love you. So I'm gonna type in, I love you, but I really like my coffee. It'll automatically complete the sentence there. But guess what? <clears throat> it's starting to give me emoji recommendations on top of it. Now, before you start laughing, emojis statistically have been shown to drive significant uplift in engagement. In fact, they also drive significant uplift in purchase intent. So what did we do? We mapped the entire English dictionary to figure out exactly based on data, not in, a, not in opinion, which emojis, which hashtags, which other emojis tend to be used with one another in real time. <clears throat> in fact, we went one step further 
We also decided to figure out exactly which emojis are being used around the world from a popularity standpoint, from a sentiment perspective, so the small business owner for the price of a cup of coffee could make the perfect decision when it comes to using emojis that are engaging. Now, based on when you type in, we'll find royalty-free images for you, so you don't have to worry about using images from Google Images that may or may not be appropriate from a legal standpoint. And on top of that, it'll figure out hashtags for you. If you don't like hashtags as, you know, that are too generic, it'll automatically give you the ability to switch them out for something else. Now, we went from uh, social media scheduling in December of 2019 and expanded it to journalism as well. Now, from a journal perspective, you can autocomplete entire blog posts for small businesses who are looking to drive traffic, especially the ones during the pandemic. Imagine being able to schedule an entire blog post to be scheduled to your favorite blogging platform, Medium, WordPress, and Shopify. And then once you're done, automatically follow it up with a social post to promote the blog post. So we went one step further. We then realized that small businesses really need help all, all over the internet. It's not just you know social media marketing and blogging. We built a Google Chrome extension that allows you to automatically, automatically autocomplete anywhere on the internet. So imagine the total addressable market of a text box. Now I'm auto-completing in Medium. You can auto-complete an in-mail in, in LinkedIn, be efficient. But then we went one step further. We realized that small businesses were being completely crushed when it comes to uh, not being able to reach them while they're quarantined at home. These smart, smart, uh, smart speakers, such as the Fire TV I'm holding in my hand or the Echo Dot, the industry grew 82%. So what did we do? We built the world's first smart speaker scheduler working alongside Amazon's. And, uh, and here we go. This is a, a simple video that Kevin scheduled from Amazon. All I had to do was go to my TV, ask for the Kevin skill, in your case, Ch Churchill skill. And within two seconds, uh, the video pops up on my TV. Um, again, you can schedule video, audio, and text-to-audio content directly to someone's living rooms. And guess what? You can have a link there and drive them back to your website right on their TV or Echo Show. So we grew pretty fast. We did over 25 million API calls last year. We grew 21,000% uh, from, a, from a growth perspective. We partnered with our biggest competitor slash co-creator, which is Hootsuite. We also turned down a, uh, an acquisition discussion we were having originally. But the vision is in the 10-year vision. Every, we need your help to go from step one to step two so yeah. that we can build the biggest company in the world helping the smallest. Just to let you know, you're, you're now into the five minutes time just to give you a heads up. Okay, for Q&A? Yeah. Okay, yeah, happy to uh, chime in on the, on the Q&A side. Thank you. Can you walk through your current um, user base and where, what, where are you targeting? Is it food and beverage? Is it retail? Is it small consulting type yeah. firms, marketing firms, who are you going after? It's a great question. So we're literally going after the smallest of small businesses. We found that even small businesses who can afford $50 a month, they're okay right now. But the smallest of small businesses who are furloughed employees, they're coaches now, they're, you know, they're uh, podcasters, they're, you know, former, you know, coffee shop owners, nail salon owners. These are the individuals who couldn't afford before and they desperately need to reach their customers today um, for the price of a cup of coffee. So we have, we went from 15 to 8,300 as of last week. Sorry, paid users or? Paid are 3,400. And we're now converting the free users into monthly plans. And most of our 95, 90% of 95% of our, our new users are continuing to buy the annual subscription. How are they finding you? What's the distribution? About 50 to 60% of our um, revenue comes from paid advertising. The rest is coming from either organic uh, sources and we need to work on our attribution channels, but we know affiliate marketing is, is starting to become a big chip part of that. And Clubhouse is actually becoming a big part of that as well. Right. I will say we've also raised capital last year. Um, so we almost have a Robin Hood uh, you know, uh, approach to what we've been doing. So we t I don't know if you can still see my screen, but um, we've raised uh, we raised about five hundred sixty four thousand last year in equity crowdfunding here in the United States. Um, we just launched our third equity crowdfunding campaign about um, a month ago, and we raised about ninety thousand. So the sales pitch is basically you invest you know hundred dollars, you buy the software for fifty to hundred dollars for the year, and you become an affiliate. You get all of it back, plus you get the upside. So we want to bring our customers along for the ride, especially the small businesses. Up next is John from Stu United. Great. Well, hey, everybody. My name is John Rondi. I am the CEO and founder of Stunited. Um, essentially, it is a social academic marketplace for students to barter their assignments and skills with one another. 
Um, and really the premise behind the idea was when I was a college student a couple of years ago, I always struggled to finish up my papers, you know, and more often than not, I would offer up this sort of academic exchange where I would say to somebody, listen, help me finish up this essay. And in return, I will help tutor you in algebra class, right? So it wasn't long till I started to realize that I could A, make a business out of this where I was making money, but uh, light bulb went off when I realized that I was not the only student with this thought process. You know, the thought process that I wanna work and get help from other students. I wanna work and give help and make money with other students and at the end of the day, really, create a, a, a collaborative community where we can all learn together. So with that in mind, I created a platform, like I mentioned, which is more of a, a academic marketplace for these students to barter their assignments, their skills for things that are inside and outside of school. So as of today, we actually went, we went through a couple of different pivots. Um, you know, to make a long story short, we launched the first version of the app back in 2017. Uh, we're actually B2B for quite some time where we were selling into schools as a retention tool. Um, unfortunately, we had contracts signed in March of 2020. So a lot of these contracts were then canceled, um, but it really was a blessing in disguise because it allowed us to get back to our roots and create a platform for the end user. So in July of 2020, we launched the rebirth of Stu United, um, which was like we mentioned, the, apps, the app that you see on the App Store and Google Play today. Um, in November of 2020, we reached about uh, 1,000 monthly active users. And as you can see from the screen here, as of February 10th, we reached about 2,900 and we actually just surpassed uh, 3,000 monthly actives. So the real exciting part of this growth is how organic it is. I mean, our, our cost to acquire right now sits at around uh, 45 cents. You know, so we leverage influencer marketing a, a pretty decent amount. I myself have roughly 700,000 followers on TikTok. So I'm able to reach my audience pretty well. Um, and so things are working from a, from a scale standpoint. We also have things such as a biz dev partnership lined up where we have an MOU signed with a company called ePrinted uh, who services over 165 million users worldwide. Um, and, and this is essentially a cloud printing platform. So more of a marketing play where we would, we would sit within uh, their technology and really you know, we, we like to say that timing is, is is perfect right now, right? We live in a day and age where technology has changed the way we all live. You know, we have the mentality of when we want something, we want it now. Um, it's United aims to be really that technology that students can lean on. Moving forward, obviously COVID has, has impacted us, you know, in a positive way where students are now sitting at home, they're frustrated, they're confused, and they're way more inclined to try newer technologies. So really at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is provide some sort of sense of normalcy back into their lives and just simplify the process that they've already been going through on a day-to-day -day basis. So we're playing in a pretty large market right now. The global ed tech market cap is at around $150 billion. There's about 500 million secondary and post-secondary students. And as of Q1 through Q2 of 2020, um, BC ed tech funding was at about 4.5 billion. And 2020 as a whole wrapped up to a record-breaking year as far as BC EdTech funding goes. We sit, you know, there, there are obviously technologies and platforms that help service um, academic support. We personally feel like we are a, you know, more so of a supplementation and not necessarily a competition, right? Where students could get on a platform like Chegg or a, a tutoring platform or even like a Facebook or, or, a, or a Fiverr to find that academic help. As long as they are learning, they can then leverage United to provide that what they've learned to the rest of the community and make some cash. So we want our students leveraging as many tools as they possibly can. That being said, we do feel like we are one of the most community driven and easy to use platforms, which for a student themselves in the age demographic is pretty essential. So the app itself, it, it features a news feed, much like a Twitter or Reddit style feed, but now it's more geared towards academics. A card stack, we actually use to call ourselves the Tinder for tutoring. So this is a place for students to swipe right on profiles they like, left on the ones they don't like. And really the bread and butter slash core functionality is the proposal feed. Your four minutes is up just to let you know, you can keep going, but it just eats into your question time. Yeah, no problem, just wrap up here. So proposal feed is essentially think of like a Facebook marketplace, but um, geared towards these academic assignments that these people are bartering. Um, business model opportunities, and I'll wrap this up here. Uh, we are a B2C marketplace, so we will act with transaction fees, 
uh, premium features for students to pay in um, on a monthly subscription, as well as tipping and note sharing, which I'm happy to get into. Uh, the team is myself, co-founder David Blyway, CFO, COO, as well as our senior developer, Chris Spanos. We have a, a graphic designer full-time, a front-end developer, another front-end developer full-time, as well as some um, you know graphic uh, content creators. So. And that is it. Thank you guys so much. And obviously looking forward to hearing all of your questions. I'm curious, have you um, seen any sort of unintended side effects of people sharing their work with each other? Like, you know, are there mechanisms in place to prevent people from just like taking someone else's work and then submitting it, for example? I think that's kind of the first big question that comes to mind if you're talking about kind of exchanging like your, you know, service for, for someone else's service or help um, or, or however you kind of described it. Yeah, no, sure. So moving, you know, in the direction of, of plagiarism, right, we plan on integrating things such as Turnitin or a third party like that. Uh, what that allows us to do is make sure that people stay honest. I mean, as well as things like that, we do have crowdsourced rating. So let's say, for example, I hop on the app and I profess to know X, Y, and Z topic in mathematics, right? The only way that you're really going to understand if I know it is, is by my rating. So like anything else, like an Airbnb or a Verbo, you're going to have to, you know, take the time for the app to sort of rate you um, and boost your credibility. Can you talk a little bit about the revenue you've generated with the current active users that you have? Sure. So we are pre-revenue right now. We are rolling out the payment processor as of actually this week. So it's been in the works for quite some time. And honestly, that's like the last thing I want to jump the gun on. So we're doing a lot of bug testing, making sure things are pretty seamless because when students start to pay on the platform, that is something that cannot, you know, that has to go pretty perfect. Um, so we are, you know, it, it is all built out, should be rolling it out probably end of the week. And what percentage of the 2,900 monthly active users do you predict will start paying? So we've actually been able, been able to calculate how much money has been transacted. Um, so in the past couple of months, we've had about $10,000 um, transacted, right? So that is either somebody professing that they will um, ask for this much slash they're willing to pay this much for whatever assignment. Average transaction size sits at around 35 bucks, which is actually a lot higher than we thought it was going to be. I mean, we expect this to be more of the five to $10 range assignment bartering, but it's great to see that students are you know, willing to sort of pay that amount. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Is this only available for university students? No, so technically speaking, and this is where it gets interesting, we, like I said, leverage TikTok only because I'm on it. Um, and we noticed that high school stuff. So high schoolers on this platform, if not as much, maybe even more than the college kids. But what's even greater is that we have post-grad kids coming back and saying, look, John, I just made a couple hundred bucks in an hour because I had some free time and I'm an expert in, you know, whatever it was finance. And this is very easy for me, but I'm able to offer a ton of, you know, guidance and help to these, these students. And do you do quality assurance and the people doing the work? So we will, I mean, what we're going to, what we plan on doing is obviously we're going to highlight and make sure that we listen to the crowdsource rating. So like we said, um, after you and I were, were in a group chat or a, a private message together, I can rate you. What we want to do is now take those all-star users and validate you. So much like a verification check mark on a Twitter, we want to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. I guess I'll, I'll, I'll finish it off. I'll, um, and obviously any questions, please feel free. Uh, we're raising on a safe right now, 500K, uh, 70K committed. We have roughly 200K on the table. Um, could be a lot more, could be a lot less. We have a lot of funds that are, that are interested in looking to close them. Um, relatively soon, looking to wrap up this round within the coming weeks here. So, uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much it from the standpoint of fundraising. And so you're still finishing up the product, and then you're going to market after. No, we're live. You're live. Well, we're yeah, we're live on market. Um, you know, bug fixes are, are sporadic. Uh, the app is actually functioning super well and looks pretty pretty great in my opinion. Got it. Fantastic. And just like that, time is up, John. Thank you very much. All right for the pitch. Thank you so much, guys. Feel free hey, to man, jump in. talking more, uh, contact me after. Awesome. Yeah, sounds great, Randall. Thank you. Fantastic. And last but by no means least is Graham from Bank Vault. There it is. It's up. 
Um, Brain Speak, CEO of Found Company. We have six patents filed worldwide, five products in market. We've just released Enterprise Solution, Plug and Play Web Security, which gives you passwordless authentication. And our killer advantage is you can deploy this literally overnight. Um, as a team, we've been together for about 10 years. We have, as I said, we've been a number of innovations. One key um, stakeholder is Whitfield Diffie, who is the founder of uh, internet encryption as we know it today, the Diffie Holland Key Exchange. He won the uh, Turing Award for this five years ago. The issue we're addressing specifically is hacking of end user devices. The goal of every hacker is really to capture login credentials to online web services, is to steal your money. Um, if you're using a password manager, then um, the, these actually expose your credentials the moment they load your encrypted password into the web form. Uh, it is no longer encrypted, it's clear text. And there's nothing that these password managers can do to stop this. The industry solution to fact authentication. This is where you step away from the device, use a second device. It's a solid idea. It's kind of a last resort. It's a bit clumsy um, and it's not infallible. Um, if I've hacked your browser, all I've got to do is change the bank account over behind the screen, move the decimal point, you authorize with your banking fob, you Google authenticate, your iris scan. There's a host of other solutions to actually hack you as well and your reputation has gone overnight. Our technology, oh, sorry, the, the market here is, is, is exploding. Um, the cybersecurity industry is not succeeding. Um, and the, 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 uh, the, the solution that everyone is looking at now is, is passwordless authentication. You don't believe that this is going to be adopted hugely, like 90% of mid-market enterprises will try this in the next two years. Um, every major vendor is getting involved in it, but the deployments of these are incredibly slow. These are major projects, and the scarcest resource you've got is the technical manpower. Now, technology has two key elements. It is clientless. Clientless means there is nothing for a user to download, install, or configure. It just works. And this is controlled by the web server. So you can deploy it literally to a million users instantly. There are three component technologies. We have an encrypted keyboard. This is an illusion that we create to capture credentials the first time only. Beyond that, it creates passwordless authentication each time a user tries to log in. And this also is a multi-factor authentication that created in a way that's completely invisible to the user. Basically, what happens in the short talk, I haven't got time to explain it, I can maybe do it in Q&A. When a user comes along, um, my video is not working here, there we go. Um, literally open the camera on your phone, your workstation lo wakes up and logs in. If you're on a mobile phone or a tablet, it recognizes you instantly and simply logs you in. There's nothing installed on the device. And we have another layer of security, which is what we call proof of presence, uh, such as your fingerprint. So this is multi-factor authentication. Some of you know your credentials, some of you have your mobile phone and some of you are, for example, your face scan. For online web services, um, Seamless access increases engagement. Security builds trust, and this therefore is a win-win for users that drives business for online web services. The advantage we have is we can deploy this literally 10 to 100 times faster than competitors, as I said, overnight. Um, we are not making any changes to backend infrastructure. Username and passwords exist on every website on the planet today. We're not changing that. There is no client software, there is no user setup, so no change management project. So the deployment of this really also has no risk technically or from a security point of view. Just touching on the market, our differentiation is we are only focusing on web services and our advantage is zero cost deployments. Um, we are already operational on Drupal. There's a Drupal uh, module you can plug in now, so it's a no code solution. We're on Salesforce. Uh, an organization could deploy this literally with 20 lines of code. Uh, as of last week, Verizon is actually now piloting this. Uh, Paychex is looking at it and we're on Drupal. Salesforce, we're looking for another 4 million right now as a super seed round. Um, it's all going into sales and marketing and the projections are large because the market is huge. Thanks very much. Right on time, Graham. Judges, you can go ahead. So, so I, I, this is Mark, I have a question. Can you just talk a little bit about, more about what, what actually has to happen for me to go from zero to, to, to working? You said a couple of lines of code, that means the web developer What's tags yeah, on? It's, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's an API, and the API integrates with the web server. So it's literally a cosmetic change on the web server. The integration is about 20 lines of code. Um, beyond that, um, we're harnessing the user's mobile phone's browser. 
So we're, we're generating secret uh, strings on that, which are run into a combination of secrets held by the web server. So your, your data that you're entering in is never a character to start with. It's, it's encoded, it's encrypted, and then encoded again. So double encoded and encrypted. And the only place it can ever be deciphered is in the target web server that originally set it up when it's driven by the user's mobile phone with their fingerprints, for example. It's really clever. How, how do you relate to the directory? Are you are you the directory, or do you need to integrate with an existing directory? How, how does that work? No, we're out, we're outside that, so we aren't changing anything with the back with the backend uh, uh, authentication server. That's the beauty of this. It'll integrate with anything. Okay, so, so every website every website on the planet today uses usernames, passwords. Okay, we aren't changing that but we're adding security to this. So the issue is always on the end user's devices. Got it, I, I'm not quite getting what, what you're replacing. You're replacing the, the, the form-based username and password login? Yes, so what we're doing is we're abstracting that now and simply transferring it to the mobile, but we're creating the illusion. And a one-time setup of that, which is really just completely intuitive to the user, is where they enter their, those credentials through their phone's browser. But they're doing it through a graphical proxy of a keyboard. There is no keyboard. That is generated by the web server and secrets on the user's phone. So these are encoded cells on the screen. They don't actually exist as characters. Beyond that, they never touch that again. You come along and open the camera on your phone, the workstation will just log you in. Or if you're on a mobile or tablet, it recognizes you straight away. It just asks to log in. It's, it's seamless. What is the competitive landscape like? Yeah, uh, there's a lot of large players in this marketplace. I mean, just six of our competitors in the last two years have raised over a billion dollars. Uh, these are privately held companies. Um, uh, our competitive edge against these companies is the fact that there is no client and there is no back-end system changes. So you literally can deploy this to Stanford University overnight if you wanted to without any risk. Whereas our competitors, you've got to make back-end system changes, migrate data, you've got to deploy clients, you've got to explain to the users how to set up those clients. It's a huge project. That's what we've eliminated. Is your unique, uh, differentiation unique in such a way that you would be a viable uh, acquisition for these big competitors? Is there any yes, but I think, we have a, I think we have a bigger opportunity than that. So I, I built this originally for LastPass, and I realized, no, no, this transcends LastPass. Yeah. This takes them into the enterprise space and yeah so our, our opportunity is actually much much broader than that so i think it would be a shame to let go too quickly the opportunity this is a potential unicorn and it's the, the, the technology behind this is, is really deep ip i mean we've been developing this for around 10 years now there's about six patents around there's a lot of trade secrets um it's really clever can you talk a little bit about your traction how many customers do you have or how many are piloting it so this particular product we couldn't talk about until we filed a patent in July last year. Um, uh, I, uh, since then, basically, we've onboarded, um, oh, there's probably about 30 or 40 companies have agreed to evaluate or trial or are actually implemented and live now. So there's a spectrum of these. We're taking revenue from the first few of these right now. Uh, but the big hairy ones really is, you know, like Verizon last week said, yeah, this looks really good. You know, we've got 100 million users. We've got a hospital in India, uh, hospital management system processing 1.4 million users a year. Each user, sorry, each patient will have their own account on the system. We've got newspapers going live with this now with, with tens of thousands of users. So the opportunities are really broad. You thought healthcare would be our sweet spot, but it's, it's turning out to be broader. So I, I, I'd be interested to follow up and learn more, I, in particular, what the dependencies are after the enrollment, um, like if devices change or things get lost and what re-enrollment looks like. Or, and what, if, you were using, if you're using one of our competitors' uh, products, you'd be screwed. You'd have to go back to inception and start again. I could literally, if for example, this was running with my bank, um, I could literally borrow your phone, log into my bank account. There is nothing on your phone that could intercept my credentials. And when I get my phone back from the repairer, I can just you know, log in as normal again. So you're not blocked in. Um, and this does more than just authentication, by the way. We can take anything from a, a currency key 
your private key, store it online in a form that can never be deciphered, other than when you're present at the moment it goes to that exchange, as an example. Yeah. Payment details, um, you know, encryption of your data, like there's a lot of other applications. It's an enabling technology. That is the five minutes up there. Uh, thank you very much, Graham. And Thanks, Graham. Of course, Graham after. Um, Thanks, guys. Cheers. Fantastic. Well, that is all the pictures for tonight. Judges, I have to say a uh, very, very big thank you to you guys for coming and seeing through that many pictures and staying engaged with it. I know that's a, that's a long slug and the extra time you've stayed is really valuable to us. Thank you very much for the advice and questions that you provided. And um, yeah, I'm sure everyone else in the chat can just give a big thank you to you. And to startups that pitched, uh, thank you. Thank you for giving your time as well, coming to the event and you know helping us put on what, what is sort of the Meet Founders investment community and the Meet Founders events. Thank you everyone for attending. Thanks, Thank you, everyone. Judge. Thanks for attending.